So I am going to get started now. Uh, my name is Bunny Ellerin. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Digital Health New York. And today we are so excited to bring you really interesting um, presentations from the NIH around non-dilutive funding, how to get started. Um, it's often a little hard to sometimes decipher um, information. And so we've got three experts who are gonna provide um, info that you need to know quickly. I wanna introduce our three panelists. I'm gonna have each of them introduce themselves briefly and then, they, and then we'll get started. So first, Myra Alvarez Lopez. Myra, can you just give a brief intro? Hi, everyone. Um, nice to have you all here today. My name is Myra Alvarez Lopez. I am the program analyst for the National Institute on Aging, and I'm happy to hear, be here today and tell you a little bit more about our small business opportunities. Next up is Michael Banyas. Hi, my name is Michael Banyas. I am the program manager for the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, we're a disease agnostic institute with the NIH that focuses on health equity research and um, most of what we fund is digital health and services. And uh, I am also a New York veteran, so it's nice to be pre presenting to the community. Woohoo! And finally, Stephanie Davis. Stephanie. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Davis. I'm the Small Business Program Coordinator for the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the institute that focuses on all things, you guessed it, heart, lung, blood, and also sleep related. I've been at the NIH for five years now, four of which have been in this role at the NHLBI. All right, over to you, Mike. Hi, can, I, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yes. So, so while, you know, NIH SBIR focuses on everything from services to therapeutics to um, life sciences, we're going to place this presentation with an emphasis on digital health, which I'm very excited to be presenting to um, the New York City community because I, you know, I am very familiar with the environment up there, the healthcare system, but also the growing, um, the growing entrepreneurial ecosystem within the city, particularly with digital health. So first, just some overviews on what the NIHC program is, and Stephanie and I are going to both share this presentation. So one of the things is, is that the NIH has this program that is actually 4% of our budget, and I'll go into budgetary figures later on how much each institute has and how it's carved up for each SBIR program. But our mission is to seek the fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavioral living systems and the application that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. That's the NIH's mo most mission. NIH's seed program is to invest in small businesses and entrepreneurs to help accelerate discoveries from bench and bedside. Next slide, please. So the NIH, the NIH is one of many operating divisions under the Department of Health and Human Services. So as you can see, we're not the only operating division that has a small business program budget, but we definitely have the largest small business program budget. Together, we allocate about $1.2 billion together to both our SBIR and STTR programs. And we're going to be going over the differences between those two in some later slides. Next. So it's actually, so our budget is a mandatory spending program based off of 3% of each institute and center's extramural funding. So money that's going out the door in grants, and it's actually 1.4 billion. But just to kind of show how this breaks down and every institute funds SBIRs differently based on how they're scored and if they have a pay line. For example, Dr. Davis's Dr. Davis's um, institute, you know, you need to get a certain level behind below the pay line in order for it to get funded. My institute director who cuts our checks, he chooses what he believes is the best science that aligns with furthering our institute's mission. But as you can see, each NIH institute, according to its extramural budget size, that's how much SBIR that they have. So cancer, um, is going to have almost like $200 million because they have a multi-billion dollar budget. 
Um, actually, I like to say that the billion dollar club is the ones with the biggest piece of the pie. NIDDK, NINDS, they're going to have a couple hundred million dollars. Um, the smaller institutes like mine, we're going to have about 20 million. Um, and it just depends on how much the institute is getting from Congress. So if Congress cuts our money, our SBI, our budgets go down. If Congress increases our money per institute, then that SBI, our budget goes up. So it's kind of nice that we are statutorily, um, statutorily linked to the extramural budgets and what how much our budgets can be each year. So as I mentioned, there are two main congressionally mandated programs that fall under the SBIR and STTR, um, uh, the, the Small Business Program umbrella. And these are the SBIR and the STTR. So as Mike mentioned, both of these have a required set aside. It is 3.2% of the extramural budget for the Small Business Innovation Research or SBIR program and 0.45% of the budget for the Small Business Technology Transfer program. So the mission for both of these programs is very similar. So they are designed to support scientific excellence and technological innovation through the, inv uh, the investment of federal research in small business concerns. And both of them, their end goals is to um, facilitate technological innovation, to fulfill the agency's mission, um, to encourage participation by underrepresented persons in technological innovation, and promote private sector commercialization of innovations that were initially supported by federal R&D. The main differences between the two is that the SBIR program is the parent program. It is required for all institutes with an R&D budget greater than $100 million. And there isn't a requirement for the small businesses to collaborate with a nonprofit US-based institution. The STTR program, however, will require that the small business collaborates with a nonprofit US-based institution, so usually an academic university. And that program is only required for agencies that have R&D budgets that are greater than $1 billion. Next slide, please. So just some other critical differences that um, I just wanted to point out real quick is that with an SBIR, yes, you can work as a, with a university. It's just they are going to be considered a subcontractor. And one of the things you need to consider is the work requirements. And all work needs to be done statutorily by law domestically. So there's always, you know, check with your program officer about if you want to license a foreign software entity, like from Canada or a foreign country, but all work needs to be done domestically because this is also an economic um stimulus program in some ways um work requirements for sbir 30 within phase one 33 percent can be outsourced phase two it's up to 50 percent with sttr that goes up to 40 percent for the small business and 30 percent for the institution research partner um it can get a little bit complicated with sttr but with sbir it's pretty straightforward and once again you can still have a university partner it's just they would need to be considered as an outsourced contractor if you're doing any work directly with them. Next slide. Oh, there we go. So uh, the small business program gives out grants in phases. Uh, and so these are not the same as clinical trial phases. This is a common misconception among the extramural community, but rather the phases relate to technological readiness. So phase one grants are small. They are usually a little over $300,000, but this can range by institute and center, and between one or two years in length. Phase one grants are meant to support feasibility. They don't have to do everything. They don't even have to prove clinical efficacy. They are basically meant to de-risk the technology enough that it is worth it to go on to the next phase, which is phase two. Phase two grants are longer and more expensive, so they can be, you know, on average, a little more than $2 million, and they can range from two to three years. But once again, the budget limits will depend on the institute or center. So that's why it's always a good idea to talk to your program officer. And these focus more on more extensive R&D activities, as well as commercialization efforts. Some institutes and centers will have additional funding beyond the phase two. So this can include um, both the phase 2B 
programs, which some institutes will participate by accepting applications through investigator initiated proposals. Others like our, like my institute will accept them through a special funding opportunity. And then other institutes participate in the commercialization readiness pilot program, which can support um, activities that are not typically supported under parent grants. And a lot of these times the activities tend to be more commercialization focused rather than scientific. The NIH does not have what's known as a phase three program. Some other agencies will have this where the agency acts as the buyer of the technology. Beyond the phase two and two B, uh, we expect that when a company is in our phase three, shall we say, it is when they are being supported primarily by private investors and strategic partners. So essentially the company and their technology have become advanced enough that they don't need us anymore. Next slide, please. And I just want to say one thing about this. One of the things is like, I will send a PDF of all the NIH program directors that Bunny can disseminate um, to her audience, but use phase one, not for what you need now, use it for what you need it in like nine months from now, like do some strategic planning because the money does take a while. We have weird cycles on when things go out the door but use it for what you want to do. And also, if you get a phase one, start thinking about applying for that phase two immediately. So benefits of NIH funding. So it's the largest sources of early life stage capital in the US. It helps with, you know, for phase ones, I like to encourage my, um, my applicants to do several phase ones you know, have those smaller research questions that help inform that larger phase two research question or use it to go into another market if you have a successful uh, product. For example, if you're doing a product that's successful in New York City within say academic medical centers and you wanna bring that into federally qualified health centers, apply to the phase one so that you can help culturally competently and infrastructure, you know, develop that product so that it can help enter that health disparities market. In addition, um, you know, I get this a lot with, with people that are doing Medicaid innovation. Um, don't say that you're applying for like a phase one to do Medicaid innovation in like five states where the environments are all very different. Do a phase one per state or phase one for like rural Georgia and phase and another phase one for like inner city Georgia, or in the case of New York, one, you know, one for upstate New York, one for downstate in the city, and how that you can actually implement and test your proof of concept. Phase one, just remember, it's a very simple proof of concept. Phase two is a larger question. But other benefits is, is that it's free money. We don't take any, we don't take any equity. In addition, when you go to your venture capital partners, or if you're making a pitch, you know, you're going to get feedback regardless. So if you get a fundable score and you have, even if you haven't used that, gotten that money yet, show that to your other funding partner and, or potential funding partner and say, Hey, this is what we've gotten. You know, we're in the ball game. You know, this is the feedback we've gotten because it helped. We kick the tires differently on these concepts rather than a venture firm would in which they're looking at your product from a profitability standpoint, and we're looking at it for what is gonna achieve the best scientific outcomes, we fund the best science. In addition, if you do get funded and you're an NIH funded company, that goes a long way towards providing validity and credibility when you go to other investment vehicles. Um, other, other aspects that we'll go into, we have a ton of post-award resources, such as entrepreneurs and residents and other entrepreneurial programs that can help if you're awarded. Um, All right, so um, when you're preparing your application, it's always good to, to plan ahead. So, you know, you need to make sure your business is going to be eligible to apply. We do have strict requirements for small businesses under these programs that are set by the U.S. Small Business Administration. Keep in mind, they must be met at the time of the award, not necessarily the time of the application. So in some cases, if you have a plan to make sure your business is eligible by the time you get awarded, that's fine. Just understand that we will confirm this eligibility before we make the award. There are four required registrations that your business has to complete before you can apply. Not before you can get awarded, but before you apply. 
The one that takes the longest is the SAM.gov registration. So I cannot recommend this enough. If you are going to be applying for, for example, the January submission date, you really want to make sure that you get started on those ASAP. Um, additionally, the NIH seed office, which oversees all of the small business programs, has a lot of really great resources um, in terms of differences um, and uh, details on the different phases and mechanisms, sample applications. So for example, Myra's Institute, the NIA, they have several great sample applications from real companies that got funded through the program that you can look at. You want to be aware of the funding timeline. So as you all can see down here, uh, if you submit in the January deadline, which is the next one coming up, the earliest your award date could be is July. But for example, if you apply in April, um, the earliest your award date can depend. Uh, at some institutes, it'll start as early as September. At my institute, the NHLBI, it will be in December. So just prepare for about a six to nine month delay between when you apply and when you could potentially get awarded. And the three application dates that you'll want to keep in mind are for most of the applications we receive. They're January 5th, April 5th, and September 5th. However, keep in mind that there are some special funding opportunities that have separate due dates. So there is a funding opportunity that all of our institutes participate in that Mike's leads that has two due dates a year in December and June. So just keep that in mind that if you're not going through an investigator initiated proposal, you might have to adjust your schedule a little bit. Next slide, please. I think we already kind of went over this. Um, okay, I'm going to go into this. So this is like one of the big questions. How are you going to be reviewed based on your scientific outcomes? So you're going to get reviewed by a panel of three scientific experts. If you apply to a specific R RFA, like the Innovations for Healthy Living, which we'll explain later, that's going to go to a panel of health disparities experts. Other than that, you get sent to study sections like the, car like the heart study section or the diabetes study section. So, and they're going to look at you, you're going to get scored on five different areas. And the lower the score is the better. You know, I've had some people be like, ah, oh, I've got a score of like 50. And I'm like, no, that's, that's really not that good. You want something like really 35 and below. So you're going to get graded on staffing. Why that's important. Have your bio sketches demonstrate how you and your team can do the work. For example, if you're doing something on diabetes and nutrition, make sure you have someone that has diabetes education or a clinician or someone with like dietary experience. Don't like you're going to need that validity there and that skill set to carry out, you know, the carry out the work. If you're doing something on, you know, cancer, you know, cancer screening, have like a, someone with like some sort of cancer screening background not someone that's just has a computer science background or a health services background. Significance, why is this important? This is where you're gonna really need to make your case. Why is this important? Why should we care? Why is this a problem? And this is where market analysis really comes in, you know, a big focus, particularly when you're focusing on health disparities, such as why is it important that we should fund this to so that this technology gets to and African American African Americans in, in like the Bronx or Hispanics, you know, up around 168th Street. Innovation. Why are you different? Now, this could either be something as you know, culturally competently, we're taking this existing technology and we're doing X, X, and X to make it to make it um, to have a different approach to implement this. In a, in, a, in a Latino setting, you know, maybe you were making it more portable, like using telehealth or, you know, so that it can be implemented in a rural setting. Talk about what you're doing that's different than what's already out there. And next is approach and environment. What are you doing and how are you going to do, how are you going to test this product, either through your proof of concept or in a commercialized setting and in what environment? This is why I have people that come to me wanting to do Medicaid innovation and they say, well, I want to do four states, which are completely different. I'm like, just keep it clean and simple, especially for phase ones. Choose one state, one population. You're just you, you don't want it to make it look like you're taking on more that you can chew. And then you're also confusing the reviewer. 
for example, an environment matters. Like don't say oh, I'm coming up with like a rural health concept, but you're testing it in, I don't know, Brooklyn. So, you know, that's one of the things you need to take into consideration. The approach and the environment and the staffing really need to go hand in hand as far as how you're carrying out this experiment and in what environment. So in addition to grant funding, which the NIH gives out plenty of, the NIH also provides additional support for companies through um, training programs, pre-application assistance resources. So here are just some of the examples of funding that we give out. So we have pre-application assistance programs that can help new and first-time applicants to uh, put together a competitive application package. We have training programs for company, new companies like i and the C3i program. We provide funding for companies to go to showcase events like Bio, Resi, Health, MedTech, and other partnering meetings. We have a company showcase webpage that shows off some of the technologies that the NIH funds. We have a whole innovator support team with subject matter experts and entrepreneurs and residents who are there to give consults to all of our grantees if they have questions related to product development. Many ICs offer support for companies to bring on candidates with the intent of diversifying the small business supported workforce. Additionally, on top of giving money for R&D activities, we also allow companies to request an allowance for things that cover technical and business assistance, also known as TABA activities. So that's additional funding that you can have on top of your parent grant that can cover things like IP expenses, market research, product and sales strategies, regulatory and manufacturing assistance. So there's a lot more that we offer, uh, more than just grants. Next slide, please. So this is the website, and now we're gonna go into the IC specific slides and we're gonna zip right through these. Um, so first, I'm in the Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Um, we're one of the smaller NIH institutes, but we also set the strategic planning for you know research priorities for specific RFAs um, that all the other NIH institutes really you know use to help provide market guidance on what are what we want to invest our seed money on. Um, just some program goals. So unlike cancer or heart, lung, and blood or aging, um, we don't focus on drugs. Like when I go to the bio international conference, I'm meeting with the state bio associations. I don't meet with any drug companies, which is nice because I, I'm not, I don't have the scientific background that I wouldn't understand what they were talking about anyway, but we focus on devices, services, digital health, and other means to help close health equity gaps. Um, you know, just some, what does a health disparity population mean? So these are just, the health disparities populations that you're going to want to focus on, not only to see if that market, you know, is getting these services, you know, these are patients or participants or customers that aren't getting services. And maybe you want to apply to a phase one to help, you know, amend your product or create a product to test to see if you could actually, you know, reach this customer base, but they include Hispanics and Latinos rural areas, American Indians, Alaska Natives, gender, just, se sexual gender minorities, which is LGBTQ, social economically disadvantaged individuals, those on like Medicaid, WIC, um, welfare, African Americans and Blacks, Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, Asians, people experiencing disabilities in North Africans and Middle Easterns. So types of NIMHD digital health investments and what are safety net providers that we really look for, you know, we'd love to fund products to actually help them carry out their mission, especially with all the federal grants that go to um, these places to help deliver care to underserved people. So we fund remote patient monitoring for chronic diseases, services to strengthen the workforce and infrastructure, um, any products to help achieve health equity, you know, and fill in those gaps, clinical trials, devices, health disparities, research support, like how can you create a product to help support the NIH's health disparities research, you know, whether it's better data collection tools or um, ways to actually analyze data or reach out to participants and precision medicine and big data. And just some types of safety net providers that are in New York City are federally qualified health centers, um, Medicare and Medicaid providers, social services, homeless shelters, 
community care clinics, public hospitals, and HRSA and SAMHSA funded programs. And I definitely encourage people to take a look at those programs because there's a lot of money behind them and they are really clamoring for places like Healthy Start or like the rural health programs to actually have products to be developed to help them carry out services to patients. Um, just some considerations that you might want to think of when you're like, well, what is a what is a barrier to health equity? Is it a physical one? Is there a clinic there? Can the person not get there because there's a lack of transportation? Um, is it a knowledge barrier such as health literacy? Is it infrastructure? Is it economic? Can they not pay for it or are the costs too high for them to get the for them to get the service? Is it cultural? Like, for example, if you're trying to do a product and in like a Latino area, in a Latino type of population, that's not going to translate maybe the same as if you tried to do it in a Caucasian population. And I don't know, I'm from Connecticut, from Connecticut. So, um, but just having those cultural comp cultural competencies to help people understand why this care is valuable for them and how that they can actually receive these services. Um, you know, one of the things we ask for is for you guys to frame your abstracts. Um, I usually ask for something up to 350 words and an aim. And the most important thing is in the first four lines, tell the audience what you're doing and trying to solve. You know, what is that health disparities population plus the health inequity problem, plus the intervention and difference from competitors and how does that equal health equity? Tell us what you're doing right off the bat. We don't need like five lines on what the problem is. Just tell us what your intervention is and how it, it could help attack the problem. Just some funding opportunities coming out. Right now we have Innovations for Healthy Living, which is very digital health based. That closes in December. We've got the January 5th Omnibus and coming soon, like it really is coming. I know I've been saying this for nine months. We have a Women's Health and Research for Health Disparities Populations, SBIR funding opportunity in which NIH, LBI, and NIA are also signed on to. Thank you, Mike. So I'm going to zip through my slides as well, but I'm just going to go over brief examples of what we're interested in funding in the digital health space over at the NHLBI. Next slide, please. All right, so we are one of the bigger institutes. So we are the fourth largest at the NIH after cancer, uh, allergy and infectious disease, and aging. Our budget is a little over $136 million to support technologies that focus on heart, lung, blood, and sleep related diseases. Minor caveat, uh, we only focus on non-malignant lung and blood diseases. So if you're doing anything that involves lung or blood cancers, I'm happy to direct you to our friends at the National Cancer Institute. But at any one time, we usually fund over 300 active projects. We're a very device heavy institute and our technology breakdown can, um, can definitely vary from time to time. But we do have a growing digital health portfolio. About 9% of our technologies fall in this area um, and an additional about 7% fall in the diagnostic and monitoring devices category. So we're really interested in digital health approaches to help patients manage um, and diagnose heart, lung, blood, and sleep diseases. So if you are thinking about doing something in that area, you will probably be assigned to us. Next slide, please. So here are just some examples of, techno of diseases of interest. This doesn't include everything that we cover at the NHLBI. So if you ever have a doubt about whether your disease falls within our mission space, just reach out to us and we can confirm if we're the best fit for your proposal. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go into everything on this slide, but uh, my office, the Innovation and Commercialization Office, which oversees the Small Business Program, like the NIH seed office, we provide not only grant support, but we also provide non-monetary support and training opportunities. So we provide application services, including applicant assistance programs, proposal guidance, and pre-application consults. We provide grant funding in the form of phase one, phase two, phase two B and CRP programs. And additionally, for our awardee community, we have several resources that can offer product development guidance. So we have our own team of entrepreneurs and residents who can help answer all of your questions that fall in their areas of subject matter expertise. We provide supplements to support things like the diversity supplement program to recruit new talent um, to your company. We support participation in the I-Corps program. 
We provide supplements to cover technical and business related expenses. And as I mentioned, we participate in the commercialization readiness pilot program for phase two and 2B awardees. Additionally, we just launched our new partnering platform that can help connect our grantees with investors and service providers of interest. So we're making it that much easier for our grantee community to help get the additional support they need to commercialize their technologies. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go over any every of these, but you know, while, mo while most of our applications come in through the omnibus funding opportunities, we do also have special targeted funding opportunities that um, are of interest to our grantee community. I wanted to point out particularly that the due date for the Innovations for Healthy Living funding opportunity, which Mike's Institute leads, is coming up for us. And, and NHLBI has been a big supporter of this program for the past three years. So if you're developing anything that focuses on heart, lung, blood, and sleep health in one or more health disparity populations, I would strongly recommend looking into this funding opportunity. Next slide, please. And even if you're going through the omnibus, we strongly recommend applying through a notice of special interest. So these are not funding opportunities, they're notices that indicate an area of high scientific priority. But if you apply through one of the omnibus funding opportunities, which are our investigator initiated proposals, you can put one of these no see numbers in the box and it will get routed through that. So it essentially tags your application in an area of high scientific priority. But I've included ones here that I think would be of interest to companies in the digital health space. So if anything that you're doing aligns with one of these, I'd be happy to tell you or not, whether or not I think it would be a fit. Next slide, please. All right, um, there we go. So um, if you could just click through all of these, I wanted to share some examples of technologies that we fund in the digital health space. Uh, and could you click just one more time? I, I wanted to frame the first two, Safe RX and, Heme, and the Aventusoft Hematag device. These in particular are funded through the Innovations for Healthy Living program. Um, and so as you can see, we have a lot of technologies that we fund in the heart, lung, blood, and sleep spaces that include everything from wearable and monitoring devices to mobile apps um, <clears throat> to programs that can you know, help patients better um, you know, improve adherence to medication regimens and everything else like that. So um, yes, uh, so I see a question in the chat. So yes, HEAL, we do participate in HEAL. NICHD and NINDS also participate in HEAL. So we, pers we, per we were in HEAL too. Yes, so just because um, some of those funding opportunities, it doesn't mean we're the lead institute. It often will mean we just, we participate in that. So if you fit under another institute, don't worry. They probably will, will be interested in your application as well. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so if you're interested in staying up to date with our programs, feel free to send us an email or follow us on X. And also I encourage everyone to sign up for our INC newsletter to stay up to date on all the recent happenings with our program and our office. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Myra to give a, an overview of the NIA's program. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, so we fund digital health initiatives for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, biomarkers, diagnostic tools, and early detection of diseases. Um, just to give you a little background, uh, when it comes to a phase, uh, the NIA has a budget of $150 million, uh, non, no strings attached, non-dilutive funding. Uh, we have an unprecedented unprecedented R&D budget to develop interventions that prevent or treat Alzheimer's disease and AD-related dementias. For our phase one, we fund typically up to a 400,000 to a 500,000. Uh, phase two, we fund uh, 2.25 million to 2.5. Uh, and for a phase two B, we fund about up to a $3 million for a three year project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, sorry, my slides are a little bit out of order, so I'll just go here. Um, so here are a couple of companies that we fund. Uh, Blue Iris Labs is a wearable light exposure sensor and a companion app to help people improve their sleep behavior and overall health. Uh, NeuroTrack is a cognitive screening tool for uh, providers to facilitate early de uh, detection of cognitive impairment and ongoing monitoring of cognitive function. And we also have uh, Wicked Sheets, which is a smart pad that is a washable bed pad with sensors that detect moisture and alert caregivers in real time when an 
incontinence, ugh, incontinence event occurs. Next slide, please. Um, at NIA, we have the uh, SNAP program, the new uh, SBIRCTR new application program. It is a 12-week curriculum designed to help small businesses prepare and submit competitive funding applications for the small business innovation for the small business uh, SBIR and STTR programs. Um, we currently have um, applications. Uh, if you want to submit one, please start looking into submitting for September uh, 5th, 2025. Uh, our, we will open uh, applications in um, September 20, uh, spring 2025. And um, I'm including here in the chat our link to our, our webpage so you can le learn a little bit more about our funding opportunities as well as um, other available resources we have at the NIH and NIA to help your small business. Next slide, please. And we also have the uh, NIA Startup Challenge, which is an immersive and rewarding two stage, five month accelerator program for early stage entrepreneurs who have innovative ideas for science-driven technologies and products that have potential to increase the diversity of NIA-funded small business research and development. Through this program, uh, finalists will receive one-on-one -on -one mentorship, craft and refine their business plans and pitch presentations. And at the end of the program, a judging panel will review the final pitches and will select challenge winners who will receive up to prizes up to 75K we are definitely encouraging entrepreneurs from diverse backgrounds to apply. Uh, will we this, currently will this also our be a health? Will this be a health? Yeah. Okay. This will be and, a health after. And we encourage um, if people to apply. Our deadline is coming up on December 9th. Uh, next slide, please. Perfect. And here are a couple of our funding opportunities. Um, like Stephanie, uh, we do uh, have our, uh, we do participate in the omnibus solicitations and we do have targeted uh, targeted funding opportunities as well. <clears throat> we have our budget limits as well uh, as listed in the screen. And um, once you get these slides, you can click on the, um, on the links to get to uh, the pages directly to the applications, uh, directly to the uh, NOFO so you can read more about that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and please connect with us. Um, we are definitely very involved when it comes to LinkedIn and uh, putting out uh, what we're, uh, the webinars we have upcoming, um, opportunities that are available. And uh, you definitely can talk to one of our program officers who can let you know a little bit more about your technology and its fit with NIA. And one thing that we really do pride ourselves on is if we're not the right fit, we will definitely connect you with the other institute that might be a better fit for your technology. Um, thank you. Thank you. We're now open for questions and I will be sending the slides out in a PDF form well with NIH program manager contacts as well in the email that Bounty can send out how you can reach us during JPM, um, con the Consumer Electronics Show. I know NIA is gonna have a booth there, but also uh, a number of NIH staff, including me, will be in New York the first two weeks in December for other events, which um, some of which are open to the public, which might be a good opportunity to uh, meet with other program officers from cancer, aging, neurology, and also the Childhood Development Institute. Amazing. Um, wow, that was a ton of information in uh, in just about 30 minutes. And we did get questions, which you've been answering um, real time. Um, just to, to reiterate what Mike said, we will definitely send out um, a link, links and the slides after. Um, so you'll get those um, pretty soon. And um, are there any other specific questions? You can raise your hand, that hand function. Oh, there we go. From actually, Ryan, why don't you turn on your mic and ask the question? Hi there. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate uh, the input. Um, <clears throat> I think that we have a proposal from our company and our partner company of co-deploying our two solutions. We want to demonstrate the impact of that. Um, and so these seem well suited to either an Institute of Aging or nursing research. 
And so I'm just still uh, kind of unfamiliar with the whole notion of the omnibus funding. So I've seen that notice a funding award and how do we know if we should go for that or for something that's institute specific is an SBIR from one institute the same as one from another institute? Um, and I think, you know, I, I'm so talking to the- I would apply, I would apply, like if you apply to like healthy innovations and you apply to the omnibus, those are considered two separate applications. So even if you go and reapply, like I think you're allowed to reapply up to like two or three times. Mm -hmm. Stephanie can, can correct me. Yeah, like, you can reapply twice. After yeah. that, you have to submit your application. Even if it's the same project, it's considered a new application and needs to be treated as such. Yeah. So like I would I would submit it to multi like every different funding opportunity, you submit it multiple times. The difference is, is that with Omnibus, all the institutes are, are participating in that. So, for example, if you wanted to choose my institute and cancer for the Omnibus, you wouldn't be able to do that for like innovations for healthy living or some of the other ones, because maybe cancer doesn't participate in that. Another thing to it's keep a in mind. Bit of a game. Sorry. It's ahead, a game. Go. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you recommend connecting with program directors to assess the fit of your proposal? Like, is that a key next step? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we're pretty, we're, we're pretty accessible. Um, we do provide a lot of customer service. Mm -hmm. So bringing um, to that meeting a one pager of specific aims, is that an expectation too? Yeah. I, I like to say about a 350 word abstract with three aims, know what you're actually applying for and just be very upfront on what you're doing. Like I just got a proposal today and it went like, it was 25 lines, 23 of them was how they got Gates Foundation funding and how wonderful they are. And I was just like, well, what's the point? I was like, just get to the point. I, I would say too, uh, Ryan, when you're speaking with multiple institutes, there could be an opportunity with both uh, two institutes can fund you at the same time as well. So but Brian, I would also talk to multiple institutes if you're interested right. because they're gonna have a different perspective. Cancer is going to have a very different perspective on health equity or SBIR or you know, then I will. And that's kind of like where the science becomes art and how you craft your proposal. Mm -hmm. The January 5th deadlines for Omnibus, is it the same if for the, if you apply specifically to an institute then? Same timeline of January 5th or are there? That's so when, so oh. when you apply to the Omnibus, Brian, you're applying to not an institute, you're applying to the NIH, but your application will get funneled to the institute or center that it fits the best with. And, and to kind of go back to what Myra was saying, there is a possibility that you could have institutes co-fund an application. So what will often happen, I'll give this as an example, NINR is a smaller institute, NIA is a bigger institute. There is some scientific overlap in their mission spaces. Let's say, for example, um, and every institute has a minimum amount of funding they need to spend. So let's say NIA, because they're smaller, they don't get a sufficient number of high scoring primary assignments what they might do is if you're if there are a secondary assignment on your NIA application, they might be willing to help support it, um, support the NIA application so that they can spend their minimum. So that's why it is often advantageous to have like a smaller institute assigned secondarily, because at the end of the fiscal year, if they have to spend their money, they will often work together with other institutes to do that. That's very helpful, Stephanie. Thank you both. Yeah, don't feel another, bad if you're confused. Like, this isn't easy. And another thing, when it comes to your second question, is SBIR award from one institute essentially the same as another? It varies when it comes to the funding of the what the institute is going to provide you. So definitely be aware of what each institute you're talking to, what the funding availability is per award, and then you'll make your decision there as to which one you want to go with. Right. Yeah, the budget limits are different based on each mm -hmm. institute. Um, and, and you know, like, for example, like NINDS, they are very generous. Their phase one grants, they will go up to $700,000. Meanwhile, like at the NHLBI, we'll do that for large animal or clinical studies. But if somebody's just propose it, proposing like a study in mice or rats, we're not going to spend that much. We'll, we'll, we're going to make them stick with the guidelines, which are about 314000 right now. Mm-hmm.
Amazing. Okay. Any other questions? Let's see. Okay. I think people are just absorbing all of this incredible information that they just got in the past 35 minutes. So as I said, we're going to send out the slides. Um, you can already tell that Mike, Myra, and Stephanie are super open, want to help you. I mean, they spent so much time already giving you info, so I'm sure they'll be open to um, receiving questions after the fact. And um, and I think I think we're good. So thank you, Mike, Myra, and Stephanie. That was really fantastic. And if you'd um, like to see oh. if you'd like to see a walking zombie, I think Myra and I are going directly from the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas to JP Morgan <laughs> San Francisco. So we might just physically be there, but mentally we're we're not gonna. Uh, okay. So don't feel bad if you like look at us and you're like you're like you're just kind of struggling there. But um, we will send out the slides and the program manager contacts. And like I said, many of us are going to be up in New York the first two weeks and uh, mm -hmm. love to be able to get together with people. I know one thing I just wanted to say is just like uh, once you do apply and you don't get a score that you um, you like or you, or you it's a fundable score. Don't give up. You know, you're going to get a summary statement with comments of the reviewers as to what can make your uh, application stronger. So definitely consider reapplying. Um, it's free money to help your technology. All you're doing is just doing a little bit of homework beforehand. So don't give up and just continue to find that money to help your technology advance. You're also going to get legitimate scientific feedback, which you might not get going around to venture firms that maybe just mm -hmm. are like, they're just not interested, not putting them down. But, you know, the, we are paid for by the taxpayers, so we want to give you the best feedback as possible to help you continue to build your foundation for your concept. Mm -hmm. I have Don't get funded the first time, and that's totally normal. Like, you know, resubmitted applications are more likely to get funded, and that's why, you know, if you have a program officer on your summary statement, reach out to them, and they can give you tips on how best to address the feedback you got. If uh, we were interested in uh, going directly to a phase two project because we thought we had had we have some track record of impact so far, can you talk to your expectations around the quality of the data from what would have been our phase one? Ooh, that's a good one. I'm going to let Stephanie handle that one. That's a good question. Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. So, you know, typically for us, like if we're talking about the digital health space, and, and I can only talk from an NHLBI per specific perspective, usually we look for some sort of app prototype to already have been developed, usually with some early stage human subjects testing. Not a trial, not efficacy, but just feedback from potential end users in terms of the user interface and user experience. Um, keep in mind, you know, going back to what Mike said, a phase one does not have to cover everything and it should not cover everything. One of the things that I think gets applicants in trouble with the reviewers is when they try to propose too much in a phase one. That being said, I always strongly recommend direct to phase two applicants reach out and talk to a PO because A, they've seen a lot of direct to phase two applicants, so they can tell you whether or not they think you'd be competitive for that. The other thing to keep in mind is applications that are direct to phase twos, they need, a, they also have a commercialization plan in addition to your research plan. So there are a lot of resources out there on how to put together a good commercialization plan. But like at the NHLBI, for instance, one of the things that we will make funding decisions based on is if we have a lot of meritorious applications with similar scores, we will often look at the strength of the commercialization plan and that will factor into our funding decisions. Because when you get to that stage, we're also expecting the company to have an established team, several full-time employees with expertise in both science and business. We're expecting them to, even if they haven't raised funds already, we're hoping that they have maybe investor interest or a strong IP portfolio that would generate investor interest. So always good to look at the expectations for those. NIA has good sample applications with, that, with commercialization plans that you could take a look at if needed. So. Yeah, it's it's just a very small research question, especially for phase ones, which is why I like to tell people to break it up because for three hundred thousand dollars, you're not going to test a, you know, a new digital health service in like four or five states or like 20 populations. Someone and it also confuses the reviewers because you have to think about it like these are people that are used to, you know, think about like dissecting the frog in like high school. 
you're you have a hypothesis where the heart's going to be you open up you cut open that chest and uh there's the heart and it leads to other scientific questions but you have to verify for but it's just a very simple question is the heart behind here our, our heart question is do these two solutions deployed at the same time make a really impact like greater than the whole we have one called an education solution and another tell a nursing solution but if you put the two of them together are they going to move the needle that's a very good phase one yes it's much more complex than the frog in the heart but yes no, no that's a very good we, phase one because now you're testing proof of concept and validity to see if it's worthy of commercialization as it happens though we received uh, medicaid funding in the state of arizona to do demonstration projects that we did you know three instances of a year-long project co-deploying the two the quality of that impact analysis isn't high rigor science you know it's good metrics of tracking some impact but it wasn't done the way that a scientific evaluation would be done and so that's partly where my question comes from is how 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 much weight will that evidence have and is it sufficient enough to say okay these two entities that are already up and running with their solutions what they're testing is the two solutions co-deployed at once they did a little bit in Arizona. Is that yeah, I, I think you just really in your research plan, just really just making it right, like tight. It works here, it works here. Now we're going to marry the two to see how the approach is going to fit in this environment. Hey, can I can I jump in? I know Nico um, would like to ask a question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's somewhat fundamentally similar question is about is it feasible to jump straight to a CRP if we have for a generic drug, it's a service-based delivery model. We have enormous data for 2,000 patients, 25,000 treatments, but goal is then to develop a strong enough data set for Medicare and Medicaid to start covering the generic under a local coverage determination. That skips a whole bunch of the earlier phase stuff, goes straight to strong data for commercial coverage. Is that the kind of thing that would be skipping? Is that not really feasible? To I, I defer to Stephanie. Yeah, yeah, you could do a direct to phase two. You can't skip. Unfortunately, CRPs are only available to companies that already either have a phase two or two B award or completed a phase two or two B award. So that seems like it'd be a good direct to phase two. But if you got a direct to phase two, you could add on a CRP award. Yeah, and then you're going to have access to entrepreneurs and residents and a whole slew of other resources. Okay, helpful. Okay. All right. Well, I think with that, we will close today's session. And again, thank you, Mike, Myron, Stephanie, and everybody have a wonderful weekend.